wasn't turning on the chat when it was saying turn on my video so i i turned my video on like nice awesome. well i'll go ahead we don't have any announcements here but i'll go ahead and hand it over to you it looks like folks are already starting to join us great great well hello everybody eat mubarak today is eid so those who've been fasting for ramadan we think this is the absolute best holiday um, ever because you were forbidden from fasting today. We're um, required to eat and eat heartily um, on Eid. So it's a very happy day. I can't wipe the smile off of my face. Um, so Eid Mubarak for everyone who observes. Um, I can't believe we're halfway through this class. And last class, if you remember, we talked about freedom dreaming. We engaged in um, some radical imagining and some uh, um, visioning work. And we're going to pick up on some of that work. But first, as we have done with every class, we're going to, oops, did I hit the wrong thing? We're going to ground ourselves. And so you all think about who wants to read our land labor and life acknowledgement. So we need three readers. Um, to read through these slides. And we can start with the first slide. Is there someone who's willing to read the first slide? And if you're willing to read, just come off mute and go ahead. Um, shall I begin? Yes, please. Yes. Land, labor, and life acknowledgement, breath. This land that we inhabit. So can we pause for one second? So that means for all of us to take a breath, if we could take a deep breath in. Ah. <laughs> Not just read the word breath. I think. <laughs> let me, let me try again. Right. <sighs> so yes, as we all take a deep breath in and a slow, deep exhale. This land that we inhabit is physically situated in the original ancestral homelands of the Tongva people. We pay respect to the Tongva and all the indigenous people, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout their historical, historical diaspora. Great. And do we have someone who can read the next slide? Thank you for reading that. Who can read the next slide? I can read it. I'm um, Mrs. Chastity. So another um, deep breath in and a slow exhale out. We pay homage to those who were stolen from Africa, placed in bondage, falsely named as chattel and forced into labor who were called slaves, but never submitted as such, who have always been fully human with an unbroken connection to the divine and to each other. We honor our African ancestors for their still unpaid labor, which built what is now the Americas. Thank you. And who can read our last slide? I can. And let's take another breath together, deep inhale, and deep exhale. To both our indigenous and African forebears, we commit to the continued struggle for liberation and reparations, for it is only through freedom and justice that we truly give honor. Aho, Ashe. Thank you so much. So what we started doing two weeks ago is making sure that we open with victories of the week. And so this week, I thought about five victories and then we'll invite you to reflect on your own victories. Um, so five victories, movement victories and personal victories. Um, we presented People's Budget LA to city council. 
I hope that some of you watched. It was an absolutely moving presentation. We had seven city council members, which was actually um, in excess of the legal limit. They're only supposed to gather six at a time. Um, but seven of them joined the People's Budget LA presentation that's still online on our Facebook page. And we presented a People's Budget where um, 3,000 Angelinos completed the People's Budget survey and wanted to invest in things like um, housing and healthcare and mental health resources. And the only area for divestment was policing prosecutions and traffic enforcement. And so again, what we saw is kind of a mirror to what had been presented last year. And most people thought um, or had tried to pretend as if last year was an aberration when last year was actually the norm. It wasn't just George Floyd that made people realize that we have to defund the police. It's the lived experiences of the people that make us realize that we have to defund the police. Um, also, on Monday, we won an injunction on less lethal munitions used by, it's not versus LAPD. Uh, no, we won an injunction against LAPD for the use of less lethal munitions. So you know that over the course of the last year, LAPD has been shooting righteous protesters with rubber bullets, beating us with batons, tear gassing us, pepper spraying us. Um, holding us um, illegally, um, zip tying us and putting us on buses in empty fields at UCLA. And um, we won an injunction against them. So initially we won an, a restraining order, which is really kind of crazy when you think about it. Nobody wins a restraining order against LAPD or against the police. We got a restraining order against the police. Um, well, on Monday, that um, restraining order was made more permanent through an injunction that restricts their use of rubber bullets against righteous protesters. Um, and then yesterday we stood with a young man, Jamal Shakir, who's 23 years old. And when he was 22, he was shot by an LAPD or on the orders of an LAPD commanding officer, um, shot with a rubber bullet Jamal recognized um, this commanding officer as his uncle, his mother's brother, um, Eric Anderson. And he called out to Eric Anderson and said, why are you doing this? As Eric Anderson was moving the police force against righteous protesters um, just days after the murder of George Floyd, um, Jamal um, called out to Eric Anderson and said, what would your ancestors say? What would grandma say? What would your father say if he saw you moving this way? And when Eric Anderson heard his nephew say this to him, he directed um, a rank and file officer to shoot Jamal with a rubber bullet and it first in his hand. And then as his phone was shot out of his hand, Jamal reached down to pick up the phone and he was shot in the backside a second time on the order of his own uncle. So yesterday we stood with Jamal Shakir as he filed a lawsuit against the city of Los Angeles and LAPD and his uncle. Um, and then personally, um, I'm celebrating a victory for me is that I fasted every eligible day for Ramadan. So. Um, sometimes I have to break fast early and this year I did not. Um, and I fasted every eligible day. So Eid Mubarak to all of those who fasted and um, congratulations on your fast and we're grateful for your fast. And then finally I celebrated Mother's Day and um, celebrated my mom and all of the other mothers in my life. And I was celebrated by my children and gathered with um, we always have something that we call single mama's mother's day. And so we gathered in my living room and backyard and um, celebrated what it is to be a mother. And so those are my victories. And I want to just invite you all to share any victories that you've had over the last week. Anybody have a victory that we need to acknowledge from the last week? I have a victory. Oh, sorry, Heather. Yeah, I have a victory. Um, two, actually. 
Uh, I got to celebrate my mother for Mother's Day as well as her birthday yesterday. So that felt really lovely, just honoring her. She's been dealing with a lot of health things for the last uh, couple of months. So that was nice. And the second thing is um, I picked up a new, um, a new, I have a new meditation class that happened. So that was very nerve wracking a little bit, um, considering that it's on this new app platform. So uh, victory in that. So thank you. All You're much. teaching the meditation class? Yeah, I teach meditation outside of SVP work like four times a week. So yeah, and it's on a platform called Open. So yeah, so I started with them, which was a little nerve wracking and exciting. So so can we all look up your med? So when we were meditating last week, you were like, ah, oh, I could have taught this. No, I, was, I didn't. <laughs> I participated in ego. Yeah, no, no, no. I definitely. I'm, but we I can probably. look up your meditation class. Yeah, if you. Yeah. She's amazing at it. Yolanda says. Yeah, so just look you up on how do we look up your class? On Instagram. Oh, if you well, if I'm on, on Instagram, I'll, I do day like often meditation. Many of the folks in here who are in my work, they definitely know I do a lot of um, my like meditation work on my Instagram live with a couple of nonprofits like the Underground Museum and then um, another museum uh, place. And then I'm on open and I have a bunch of like recordings on my own Instagram at own girl alley there. So, Oh, good. Yolanda just dropped your Instagram. Yeah. I usually keep yeah. everything updated there. My website isn't as updated because you know, time and capacity these days. So, but yeah. Congratulations on that. We need more black women lead in meditation. So I'm going to look that up. Too. <laughs> Absolutely. Good. All right. Anyone else want to share a victory? Yeah, sure. I'll share a victory. Um, they're both in, there's two of them. They're really in the sphere of, um, hi, I'm Heather, by the way. Um, hey, there's two in the sphere of um, uplifting the idea that Jews are not only white people, which is a very like white supremacist understanding of the white community, of, of the Jewish community. Um, and uh, I uplifted the idea that in the 1100s in Spain, 90% um, of Jews were Sephardic Jews and not Ashkenor uh, Ashkenazi Jews. Um, and so we had a whole big discussion about Jews of color and poetry and um, art and things. But also yesterday there was a new Pew study that came out about US Jews. And it really, it uplifted that um, the last study last year said there were only 6% of the Jewish community was people of color, but this one said it was 15%. And I led a program yesterday that uplifted that idea. And um, there's gonna be another one tomorrow um, to, to kind of look at the, the implications for the Jewish community. So just more about looking at the intersectionality of the Jewish community, the black community, the people of color um, all together. That's awesome. This is what happens when you have a rabbi who was an African-American studies major. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Heather. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Well, oh. I do go ahead. I just noticed that Robin was raising her hand. Okay, Robin, come on. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Just really quickly, a personal victory for our family. Um, on Mother's Day. Um, this, our oldest son is uh, adopted. We adopted him from the Philippines. And this last week, we were able to reunite as one large family with his birth family. That turns out um, he's in Toronto and his, almost his whole family is also in Toronto. And oh, wow. so as our as my vision statement, we were looking at uh, how to grow as um, our family. This was a huge victory for our whole families to be united. Amazing, congratulations, amazing. And that's beautiful for him. That's beautiful for him. Beautiful for all of us, for both yes. mamas, me and his birth mama, to yes. be united in loving on him. Yes, yes. All right, anyone else? And I can't always see when your hands are up. So if you want to just unmute, if you had something to share. Okay, um, so I did want to um, get into some of what's going on in the world. And some of you have 
seeing what's happening in Palestine. And it's really important. We just closed out the reading of Black Power. And as we think about Black Power, oftentimes we contextualize it in a US context, but the struggle for Black power is a global struggle. It's a global struggle. So it includes absolutely um, the fight against um, white supremacy in this country. But as we read through Black Power, we know that Kwame Ture and Charles Hamilton also talked about colonialism and African Americans as being colonial subjects of white supremacist capitalism. And um, oftentimes we think about that in different terms, but that's how they absolutely described it. And so as we look at what's happening in the world, especially the most recent assault on Palestinians, there becomes a required response, a required show of solidarity as folks who are struggling for Black power to understand the assault on Palestinians um, also requires that we all rise up. Kwame Ture said that liberation movements fight against imperialism, not with it or not alongside it. And so I just wanna play you a short clip of Kwame Ture, and then we're gonna have a guest lecturer come in for just a few minutes and I'll inter introduce her in just a moment. But first let's hear from Kwame Ture. That great man, V.I. Lenin, at the turn of the century, wrote a book entitled Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Is it imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism? Yes. If one would read this little pamphlet, one would see here that Mr. Lenin had precisely pointed out that all of the world had already been conquered and divided by colonial powers. There was no else in the world left to be conquered or divided by colonial powers. This is the time when Zionism comes to rise. Zionism comes to look for a state when everywhere else in the world is already dominated. But in order for Mr. Herzl to get a country for Zionists, what he did was to attach himself to imperialism. British imperialism in this case, quite specifically. Of course, as an African who suffered under the heels of British imperialism, I can have no love for it, and certainly I cannot love anyone who attaches themselves to it and attaches themselves to it for the foundation of the state and then call this a liberation movement. Liberation movements fight against imperialism, not with it. Let me hear. foundation of the state of Israel is what is known as the Balfour Declaration. This declaration was issued in 1917. A man in the government of Britain named Balfour wrote a paper and promised the Jews a national home. The national home he promised them was an area which Britain was colonizing, Palestine. Palestine didn't belong to the British, just like Ireland doesn't belong to the British, even though they have troops there. But here, these British imperialists gave, signed a note and gave it to the Jews and they accepted it. Where is the morality for this? If you say that Israel belongs to you, then you don't go to a thief to get Israel to go and take it. Once you go to an immoral, immoral being such as British imperialism, and this is the basis for you getting the land, then clearly here, those who are truly liberation fighters must question this. The basis we say is the Balfour Declaration, Zionist no image. The Zionism is certainly not a liberation movement because it never fought against any imperialism. As a matter of fact, today, Zionism is the baby, child, and infant protector of imperialism in the Middle East. It carries out the interests of American imperialism. As a matter of fact, a Zionism and American imperialism is like this. If our tax dollars would stop giving money to Israel, the state would sink tomorrow. And certainly no one can deny that American imperialism is the leading imperialist nation in the world. So we cannot see how a liberation movement is so tied, string in hand to American imperialism. They work hand in hand with American imperialism. Thus they can hardly be a liberation movement. In addition to this, Zionism has nothing to do with anything religion, nothing. All religions are concerned with human beings after they die. That's what religions are for. Islam will tell you what happens to you when you die. As a matter of fact, this which forces you to live a good life so that after death, you'll be able to enjoy the rewards of heaven. 
The same is true for Judaism. But Zionism says nothing about the individual after they're dead. They don't give a damn about you. Because Zionism mm. has nothing to do with religion at all. And one should not make the confusion here. The Palestinian state belongs to the Palestinian people. This is a fact. Okay. Okay, so that's that what... Great? That's what Kwame Ture has to say about Zionism and American imperialism. And that has a lot of resonance in this moment as we think about the attacks on the Palestinian people. And I wanted to invite a guest lecturer. This is my first time introducing her under this title as a guest lecturer. She is a 17 year old abolitionist. She is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter Youth Vanguard. She's a freshman at Howard University in African-American studies and a leader in the Kwame Ture Society. She's also the mobilizations organizer for March for Our Lives. And I am proud to say that she is my daughter, my oldest daughter, who's been advising the Black Lives Matter Global Network on what's happening in Palestine at the moment. And really um, it's been her languaging um, and uh, helping us to understand what's help, help happening in Palestine um, that's been guiding the global ne network in Black Lives Matter grassroots. And I just thought that she could ground us down in this as we think about black power in a global context. Why is it that we need to have something to say about what's happening in Palestine? And what is it that we should be saying and doing about what's happening in Palestine? So I'd like to introduce Tandiwe Abdullah. And I'm moving, come on time. <laughs> okay, well, in Mubarak everybody, um, thank you for having me in class, I guess. Um, wow, this is my first time here. Yeah, there's stuff on it too. Oh, hi. The only times I've ever been in here before was in like elementary school when I was pretending to be sick so that I could leave. So it's nice to be here in like a real time. Can I admit whoever's in the waiting room? Yeah, there's other people. I got it. We'll take it. But well, okay. Um, so yeah, when we're talking about when we're talking about Palestine, right? Um, a lot of people might be wondering, like, why is it so important to Black people what's happening, you know, way across in another country? We don't live there. This is, what does this have to do with us, right? Um, shouldn't we be focusing on Black liberation? What does this have to do with our struggle and our liberation? Um, but there's a reason why almost every Black radical that you will probably read from is pro-Palestine or um, speaks out against Israeli um, settler colonialism, right? We have to, as Black people, understand that our liberation is tied to um, the liberation of all oppressed folks everywhere. So that means Indigenous people in America, right? That means um, Indigenous folks in Japan, in uh, Palestine, right? Um, everywhere where there's oppression, we have to make sure that we are um, in support of whoever is being oppressed, liberation, right? Um, and so I think um, Baba Ture, Baba Kwame Ture does a really good job of explaining that because Israel um, attaches itself to the belief, yeah, attaches itself to not only British imperialism, but American imperialism, right? These are our tax dollars being put into IDF, right? These are our tax dollars being used to fund um, an apartheid state. Um, and we, when we also talk about police brutality, we're seeing that American police officers are training with the IDF. So our oppressors here are linked to the oppression of Palestinians in Palestine. Um, we have an obligation to, I guess, speak up about what's happening um, in the most honest and respectful way possible, um, making sure that we are um, uplifting the voices of Palestinians on the ground. Um, I can give, should I give resources? Sure. 
Okay, there's a man named Mohammed Al Kurd, which is like a Palestinian um, activist. There's, um, you know, a woman named Shata, not Shata, on Instagram, who are talking about, you know, what is happening on the ground and what has been happening, and they'll explain like how we got to where we are today. But the fact of the matter is that what's happening in Palestine right now, it's not, it's not what the American media makes it seem to be. The reality is that America is a settler colony and so it will support settler colonialism, right? So of course, of course- What this, does that mean that it's a settler colony? We're not a legitimate state. <laughs> That's what it means. Uh, my mom said, what is a settler colony? Uh, we're not a legitimate state, meaning that we are founded on the belief that um, our legitimacy comes at the expense of the indigenous peoples who are already living here. So we settled on indigenous land um, and so did Israel, right? We settled on land um, where there are folks already here, um, where we had to ethnically cleanse the indigenous peoples in order to maintain our legitimacy, right? In order to establish ourselves as a state. Um, and so therefore our existence is not legitimate because we, we have no grounds to be here. Um, same thing goes for Israel, right? And so when we talk about, you know, the narratives that are being pushed around Israel, we can't look to America to give us the truth. We can't look to America to steer our moral compass because we are, we're in the same boat. Uh, this country, I guess, I don't align myself, but this country is in the same boat, is, is in bed with um, colonialism, um, ethnic cleansing, we've done all those things. So um, we really have to be looking to Palestinian activists on the ground, um, our black radicals who, you know, tell us why we're in this fight to begin with, um, and yeah, is there anything else I should say? Is there anything we should be doing? Um, anything we should be doing? There's a lot of crowdfunding going on right now. Um, I'm sure you can find them on Instagram. That's the one thing I'll say about the infographic industrial complex. They have been putting to work, putting it to work. Do I have Instagram handles? Yeah, I can give them to you after, right? You can put them in the chat. Okay, um, I have handles that I can give right now. Sorry, it might take a while, but there's also a bill um, that was proposed by, oh God, I hope I don't mess this up. There's a bill that's in Congress, that's all I'm gonna say, that was proposed by a Congress person. Um, and it is in support of BDS. So also when we talk about BDS, which is boycott, divest, sanctions mm -hmm. um, against Israel. When we talk about BDS, um, it has been really manipulated by American um, media and by Zionists to seem as if it is something different than what it actually is. But it's like, we need to be supporting BDS right now. It was um, something that was proposed by Palestinian activists um, as a way to actually show up in support of the work that's being done on the ground in Palestine. So um, here is... I was gonna also say, right, we dropped it in the chat, but if it helps, if you wanna just kind of, uh, if it works for you to just kind of create some resource links, and you can have- I was gonna say, that might be better because- Yeah, send it to the admins. Um, uh, Dr. Bula knows where to send it and then we'll get it up on the call to action page so that folks can be able to resource. Okay, great. Anything okay. else or no? Ask if they have any questions. Any questions? Sorry, I didn't prepare anything. I just like kind of came. I, I told you. Yeah, you did, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Hi, I have a question. Oh, Tandiwe, thank you so much for your presentation and um, your work and Eid Mubarak. Um, I wondered if, if you knew of any particular 
African American Palestinian alliances um, that are kind of already organized um, in this in this work. I know that you had mentioned, which makes so much sense, that you know we as Black people recognize the need to um, speak to this to the, the Palestinians uh, plight. Um, but I wondered if if there were any particular organizations that are in partnership or anything like that? Um, so I can't think of any off the top of my head that, I mean, that I've personally worked with, um, but I do know that Palestinian youth movement has been very involved um, with organizing other Palestinians in support of Black Lives Matter and also has been involved um, with us in like solidarity work. So asking us to support and amplify what's going on right now. Um, but I mean, like historically, there has been a lot of um, African-American and Palestinian solidarity, um, especially like during the civil rights era and the black power era. Um, we had people who, we had folks like organizers going to Palestine and learning from um, Palestinian activists there. Um, I can't think of who specifically off the top of my head, but I remember like reading about Black Panthers. Yeah, he, okay, Huey P. Newton went to Palestine and um, spoke with Palestinian organizers on the ground. So it's always been like um, a part of, I guess, our community. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully it will be going forward. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for having me. All right, so I just thought it was really important to lift this up because as we struggle for black power, we have to remember that black power is happening now. It's not just books that were written in 1967. Um, that constitute black power. It's about what we're doing on the ground right now. It's imperative that we recognize it as a global struggle. And it's imperative that we take positions that sometimes cost us something. So Rabbi Miller will tell you that I know sometimes when we speak out for Palestine, it costs us something. I, I've been personally canceled a few times and had to go and say, what do I do about this for having to, has spoken out against, against Palestine? But as Kwame Ture reminds us, we have to fight against imperialism. We can't just allow it to um, grow and be silent. Black power and freedom, in Angela Davis's words, are a constant struggle, right? And so we have to be willing to engage in the struggle and not seek um, comfortable places in oppression. So I'm very grateful to be Tandiwe's mama and that she was willing to come and share with us. Um, and so I think that that also walks us into what we're talking about for the remainder of class today, which is last week we talked about what does freedom look like, feel like, taste like, sound like, um, what else, smell like, right? Is that all five senses, right? Um, and, and as we move into this new text, Robin Kelly's Freedom Dreaming, Robin Kelly reminds us that freedom and love may be the most revolutionary ideas available to us. So to be free, to seek freedom, to seek those images that we summoned up um, to seek those sounds that we summoned up, those are um, the most revolutionary things that we can do because we are seeking freedom. We are working towards freedom by um, invoking those images. And so building towards freedom requires three things. It requires that we vision. So last week, um, we talked about visioning. We talked about um, why it's important to have vision statements. And I know some of you all shared your vision statements. If there's anyone else that would like to share their vision statement, um, I wanna invite you to do that now. And then we're gonna talk about building and celebrating our victories. 
Um, so were there others that wanted to share their vision statements before we go into the um, build step? I'll share mine. I wasn't here last Wednesday. I apologize. This is Chastity to hear what others wrote. So I hope this is in line with what you wanted, but, um, or what we were asked to do uh, for my vision statement. So I wrote, I envision a world that is not a utopia, but striving to be one and finding new ways to be inclusive, healthier, cleaner, and more equitable. I envision a world where every person has clean, accessible water and a rich diet of food from sustainable sources, where basic preventative health care is assumed and provided for all, where education and learning is lifelong and encourages the person's natural curiosity and talent. Finally, I envision a world um, that respects and cher cherishes all life from the cradle to the grave and where its citizens are taught to see the beauty in their differences and similarities. Beautiful, beautiful. Anyone else wanna share with us? Um, I'd like to take a moment to share. I can't share my camera, unfortunately, but I, I'll, I'll share um, part of my vision. Um, this is Consuelo. Um, I, first of all, wanted to say I love the class and thank you so much for it. Um, and that the vision statement that uh, you included, Dr. Abdullah, I'll just say that's the overarching statement, like sure, like that vision statement <laughs> hits all of the points. And so there, there there's that, that's, you know, yes. Um, but mine is a little bit more of a, of, of a short term, like of a, of a nearer term vision that I wanted to share, um, which is like, you know, feels like more like how, how I wanna to get to the next phase of what we're doing. And so mine is that the, the overarching worldview is of a society that can begin to take accountability for its real and destructive history. Um, Western society has, you know, and, and within this vision that we've chose to pause and focus on the traumatizing reality of the present times and communicate and solve our way beyond them. That people active, actively engage in difficult, necessary and fulfilling conversations of re-education and action and solution finding. Um, we have reprioritized the human experience of true care, health, and safety, especially for all children throughout the world and of women and marginalized persons. Um, it's not complete. There's still a part that I wanna include about basically us um, uh, studying and focusing on different indigenous cultures so that we can, you know, basically understand other ways that we can live and protect each other as well as the earth. I love that. And I love that you call it a short term statement. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but like right now, we all yes. have this. That was, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Oh, thank you. Anybody else want to share? I can share. I, I first want to say um, I'm really struck by how there a lot of the things that I wrote down were already said in other people's statements. So I just want to like acknowledge the collective spirit in the in the room, and I'm really grateful. And so I wrote down a lot of things. I watched yes last week's session, um, and so I'll just read a couple of the things that I think. I haven't yet, I haven't heard just as an offering. So um, I wrote down uh, a vision for a matriarchal approach that uh, permeates how we define leadership, uh, a, a collectivist. And I think I heard you say last week, Dr. Ab Abdullah, um, a collectivist leaderful approach versus a hierarchical individualism approach in leadership. And then I wrote a society which moves from a way of being that, that conceives of progress as um, being measured by the wellness of, of indigenous people. Ashe, Ashe. 
All right, these vision statements, I think that you're absolutely right. There's so much overlap in the vision statements. And that's also part of the purpose of visioning, right? Because it helps us to determine who our people are, right? If our visions are shared, um, then that means that we're each other's people, right? And so we can build together. And that's really um, where I wanted to go with um, most of the remainder of this conversation mm -hmm. is what the building looks like. Um, so, you know, we have to vision, we have to take a step back um, and think about the world that we want to be. And then we have to do work to build. So you have sometimes when you talk about movement building, when you talk about black power, you have people who are great philosophizers, right? Who like to sit and talk about ideas and pontificate. Um, and sometimes that's really important, but when ideas are just ideas, when they never come to fruition, that's not really moving black, black power forward. And so some building has to come to, has to be a part of it. We have to absolutely build towards the vision of the world that we want to see. And so this is what we're talking about when we talk about demonstrations, when we talk about policy work, when we talk about protest, when we talk about what abolition means in terms of upending unjust systems and building towards new ones. What we're talking about is building and organizing. Right, so at the end of this class, when I put up um, the calls to action for the week, what that's about is how can you contribute to the building? And that's not the only ways, what I'll, I'll give you as a list are not the only ways that you can build, but there's some ways that you can build because sometimes as we vision, even when we write down our vision statements, the visions become so large that it becomes very difficult to think about how do we get to that, right? If we think about what we see, right? When we see a world of, you know, green grass and oceans and the end to, you know, these huge edifices to capitalism, it becomes this overwhelming thing where you think, how can I even knock down one building in downtown Los Angeles, let alone, you know, get rid of, you know, every Walmart, right? Um, and so we have to think about how to do that. How do we build towards it? And every effort that we make, every petition that we sign, every dollar that we donate, every time our feet hit the pavement, that's actually building towards our vision, right? And so I do something um, that I showed for you last week called a scaffold. And um, I want to encourage us to always think about the scaffold, and I'll go back to the previous slide in just a second. What we did is that first thing, the visioning, right? An inclusive and affirmative statement that defines the community that we are working to build, right? The world that we are working to build, right? So we built the statement and remember our statement is fluid. It's not stagnant, it's a living piece, right? That we should constantly go and fine tune and make sure that that's still our vision for the world, right? But then we have to think about how every vision has requirements of different systems. So the vision statement that I wrote um, has requirements of what a system of public safety should look like. My public safety system underneath my vision does not include police, prisons, or jails, right? My public safety system requires that we invest in neighborhoods and communities, right? My public safety system means that it's kind of connected with an educational system that's liberatory. Um, it's connected with a, an economic system where people have all of what they need and most of what they want, right? But these systems also become transformed and rewritten according to our vision, right? According to our vision. So once we have a vision, we can no longer accept a system of education where they say that our children are there to basically be indoctrinated and be, um, be um, kind of uh, pulled into um, 
a system of white supremacist patriarchal heteronormative capitalism where they're taught to be good little boys and good little girls and go along with the system as it's defined for them. So I can't have a vision and then accept a system like the current system of education that we have. I have to do work to transform that system, right? I can't have a vision and then accept the public safety system that we have. I can't have a vision and then accept the healthcare system that we have. And I'm also able to zero in on particular systems over which I might have some influence, right? So I've chosen to focus primarily, not exclusively, but primarily on the system of public safety. And then as we say, every time our feet hit the pavement, every time you know, we work on a new policy, every time we sign a petition or lobby an elected official, that becomes an objective that influences that system. So one of the things that we're saying right now as LAPD, which we're seeking to upend, as abolitionists, we're seeking to abolish, right? As they say, they need 67 million more dollars in order to not beat protesters, not brutalize protesters. We say that's absolutely ridiculous, defund the police, fire the police chief who issued the direct orders to beat and abuse and brutalize protesters. And that's the way we get to the transformation of the system. So objectives include both transformative efforts as well as what we call non-reformist reforms, non-reformist reforms. So an assignment for this week is for you to figure out what systemic level effort is going to be your primary one? Are you going to primarily deal with the system of public safety? Are you gonna, oops, are you going to primarily um, deal with the system of education? Are you gonna deal with the healthcare system? Um, spiritual systems are also systems, right? What systems are gonna be your primarily, primary focus? And then what objectives underneath those systems are you going to take on? What's one thing that you are going to do in order to move that system into a space, into a transformative space? So your assignment is to figure out your system of primary focus, as well as one objective that influences that system. Does that make sense to everybody? Good. And then we'll come back next week and you all will share um, one of your victories because as we talk about the three things that are necessary as we move into, um, as we struggle for black power, the third component is celebration right? So we can't just vision and build and win and then keep going because remember, this should actually be in a loop that you vision, build, celebrate, vision, build, celebrate, right? We have to constantly celebrate our victories or as we talked about a few weeks ago, the movement for Black freedom, right? The movement for Black power can become depleting, we want this movement to be restorative. We want to make sure that we feel fulfilled, that we celebrate what it is we're winning, right? And we are winning. There are major, major victories that we win all the time. We're in a constant mode of winning. And one of our chances when we fight, we win. Whenever we fight, whenever we build, whenever we struggle, we win. But we have to celebrate those wins in order to keep us in the struggle and also in order to bring more people into the struggle. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Do people have ideas? Um, we have a few minutes to share. Do people have ideas about what systemic um, level change or transformation you're seeking? What's the primary system that you'll seek to influence or you are seeking to influence? Um, I've been working to um, build awareness and advocacy 
at the intersection of homelessness and racism. Even though we've had the fair housing law um, since 1968, and we're, we're recognizing, you know, as a society that there is, we've known the data in terms of access to housing and how, how housing has been a tool for implementing and furthering and, and maintaining white supremacy. But it's only very recently that the homelessness sector is, un, is recognizing and understanding that. In fact, I'm part of a group of people who in 2017 began to raise awareness um, around that intersection, given that across the country in every single state, black and brown people experience homelessness at a disproportional rate to their representation in the population. And so there are overwhelming rates that have, that have been st stagnantly there uh, of BIPOC experiencing homelessness. And yet all this talk about ending homelessness and no one has tried to end homelessness with a critical race theory uh, lens. And so that's been the work that I've, I've been doing, but I'm also an artist um, and so, and an actor and, uh, and a professor in, in acting. So the whole piece about having an objective is really, really uh, speaks to me. And I, and I think um, that, th you know, thank you for offering that frame. It's also very affirming. Thank you. And are you connected at all with LA Can? Are you in Los Angeles? I am. Are you connected with LA Can? Um, I have. I have. I don't have any personal connections with LA Can, but it sounds like I should. <laughs> yeah. So LA Can, the Los Angeles um, uh, Community Action Network, which is at eight three eight East Sixth. If you ever wanted to go visit eight three eight East Sixth, is the only. Um, uh, organization built on the Black radical tradition for unhoused folks. So rather than being a, um, and thank you for posting that Yolanda, that's their website, cangris.org. So rather than being a social service organization, right, providing beds or providing food, they do that too, they provide food too. Um, but rather than focusing on that, what they do is empower unhoused folks to fight for their own interests. And um, it's really grounded again in the black radical tradition. So the founder and executive director is um, absolutely my brother from another mother. His name is Pete White. Um, and I serve on the board there. Um, they do amazing work. And I think you really like it because um, art and culture are critical to what they do. So there's, they have the freedom singers that are part of what they do. They have um, culture Thursdays where um, there's like a jam session. They have a, um, they have a, a improv group. I guess they're for improv. Like, yeah, I think they're improv um, that comes out of there. And so I think you really appreciate what it is they do. So again, remember, our visions, uh, our goal with our visions is finding other groups and people with like visions so that our power can come together. One thing that I haven't talked about yet fully in this class, I did a little bit with that solidarity talk, um, is that the kind of visions that we're seeking, right, to usher in, um, the kinds of transformative change that we wanna bring to this world white supremacist capitalism, white supremacist patriarchal heteronormative capitalism feeds us this lie of individualism. So there's a reason why they feed us this lie about um, civil rights and Martin Luther King, right? And, you know, Martin Luther King came down, he has been to the mountaintop and had, uh, had a dream and his vision was that little white boys and little white girls could hold hands with the little white girl, white boys and little white girls. And did I say white and white, white and black, right? <laughs> that they would hold hands and all of a sudden racism ended and we're all free, right? That's the story that we're fed in the system of education that we're seeking to transform. But the reason they tell this story of Martin Luther King as a messiah and pretending like even the right wingers pretend like, and we love him. No, you didn't love him. If you loved him, he wouldn't have been assassinated, right? Um, and so 
The reason they tell us this lie about Martin Luther King having a dream and being this great man and everybody should seek to emulate King and we should wait for and look for and aspire to be the next King. The reason they tell us this lie and the reason I say it's a lie is not because Martin Luther King wasn't a great man. He was absolutely a great man and a great orator and a great thinker and a great visionary um, and one who was willing to and um, saw it coming that he would sacrifice his own life. So this has nothing to do with lack of reverence and appreciation for Dr. King because I do revere and honor and love him, right? It has to do with the fact that Martin Luther King was empowered by Ella Baker. Martin Luther King was pushed by John Lewis and by Kwame Ture, right? He was challenged by Septima Clark. It was Joanne Robinson who called the Montgomery bus boycott. There were thousands of people that made up the civil rights movement. So it's important that we push back against this notion of individual messianic leadership because that's never been how we get to transformation. The reason that we're um, developing these visions is so that we can look to each other and say our visions are aligned. So how do we struggle arm in arm? Because there's no way we can topple a system of white supremacy, topple a system of patriarchy, topple this intertwined system of oppression, these systems of oppression as single individuals. And so even as we look at particular institutions and the particular systems like housing, Saba, it's important that you say, you know what, maybe my thing is at Midnight Mission. Maybe my thing is LA Can't. They over there are browned in their work in uh, Black radical tradition. Let me take a trip over there and see if I can help with that. So that's what we wanna encourage um, all of us to do is to figure out who our people are, get with our people and really usher in these visions for change. So again, you have a homework assignment for next week. What system is your primary system that you wanna influence? And what is one objective you have for yourself? So your objective is a measurable, tangible thing. I want to circulate this petition to tell people to pass a, tell city council, pass the people's budget and reject the mayor's budget. I want to get 10 people to call into the LA Police Commission and tell them to block the $67 million that LAPD says it needs in order to not shoot righteous protesters, right? Um, what's one tangible, measurable thing that you're going to do? So that's what you're going to bring to class next week. And I thought I had way more time than I do, um, but I don't have much more time. So I want to share a few calls to action. Um, one is today at three o'clock and some of you came last week. That's great. If you're going to come this week is another don't miss week because this is our arts and culture week at in police associations. We are in front of um, the beautiful mural um, at the ACLU building at 1313 West 8th Street, standing right in front of the LA Police Protective League, chanting it down. So that's today at three o'clock and every Wednesday at three o'clock, please join us. Um, tomorrow night on This Is Not A Drill, which is our online um, political education piece, uh, one of our members, Lamika Castillo, is going to be talking about reimagining child safety. That's the system that she wants to influence. This is foster care month. And so she's going to be talking about why we have to decouple police from child and family services. And then also on Thursday, actually, this should have gone ahead of it. This is directly related to this concept of visioning. Our arts and culture team, Black Lives Matter arts and culture team, has a museum exhibit opening called New Black City, Imagining a City Without Police. And this is visual arts, performance arts, it's archival material. It's at the Museum of Social Justice on Alvera Street, 
Um, and so you all know that that's a wonderful area to walk around. It's going to be up from tomorrow. I mean, yeah, from tomorrow through June 7th. But our opening ceremony is tomorrow from 2 to 4 p.m. So come out. We'll probably have really good food. Come out and um, join us for New Black City. We've been talking about what's been happening in Palestine and the strikes on Sheikh Jarrah. Um, in Palestine, and there is, I left off a G on there, but there is a protest that the Palestinian youth movement is leading nationally. The one in Los Angeles is in front of the Westwood Federal Building. Black Lives Matter will be there in solidarity. We hope that you will too. And then organizing isn't just protesting in the streets, it's also planning. Please join us for our Black Lives Matter Los Angeles monthly meeting, Sunday at seven o'clock at Ward AME Church. And then these are the two, uh, the survey and the petition that we've been circulating. If you haven't signed, please do. And that is what I have for you today. It's 101. Is there anything I'm forgetting, Ali or Yolanda? Nope, uh, I would say the only thing is we'll also get those lists um, of everything related to Palestine um, on the website as well. Uh, for later, but that's about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdullah. Great, thank you everybody. Have a great week, hope to see some of y'all later this afternoon or later in the week. Thanks.